Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming to today's, what are we calling these, Elizabeth? 430 talk. 430 talk. <laughs> we should have tea, really, if we were going to be really hospitable, but okay, we'll forgive it. Um, so it's really a pleasure to be here to introduce today's speaker, uh, who is Jared Bernstein. Jared is currently a senior fellow at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, which if you look on their website, you see that he is an expert in all things that are relevant in economics today. Um, and I can tell you from personal experience that that is uh, going to be true. Um, so he focuses on federal and state fiscal and economic issues, employment and earnings. Uh, he also thinks about financial and housing markets. Um, one of the things that's great about Jared is he's a skillful interpreter of data and of economic trends and what's going on. And as a result, it, because he really understands the data, he communicates so well as well, which is you will see if you, uh, if you, you know, turn on the TV and you watch CNBC, MSNBC, you will see him very often giving very insightful commentary. But also, if you look, he's a blogger, and he's got a really interesting blog called On the Economy, which I think has very valuable insights. Uh, as well. So Jared has been thinking and writing about economics for quite a while. Uh, he, um, uh, he spent some time at the Department of Labor as a deputy chief economist, but more importantly, he comes to us from the Economic Policy Institute, where he was a senior economist and he was also director of their Living Standards Program. If you're familiar with the Economic Policy Institute, you know that every year they publish a very nice a uh, summary of the United States and what's happening in our labor force called the State of Working America. And Jared co-edited co nine editions of that. He's also been the author of two books, uh, or a book uh, called Crunch, Why Do I Feel So Squeezed? Uh, he's a contributor to many journals and magazines. Um, just on a personal note, I got to know Jared uh, in, in the Obama White House, where he served as the chief economist and a policy advisor to Vice President Joe Biden. Uh, it was really a pleasure to work with Jared. He always came to meetings prepared. He had something new to add. There was this whole very big team of economists, very thick with ideas, everybody having their own interpretation. And Jared always man managed to find another interesting idea in the data, which all of the rest of the people had overlooked. Um, he cares deeply about uh, the troubles that, we've got, that we're going through. He cares deeply about workers. And he was just a really valuable member of the economic team. Um, so I know that today's talk will be really interesting as well. And I think it's a delight and a treat. And I will turn things over to Jared. Wow, that, was, that was such a nice introduction. Uh, thank you very much. I was thinking back to the days uh, uh, back in, in, in the White House and all those economics teams meetings. and. I can return uh, uh, the compliment to Cece. Uh, one of the ways you could win an argument uh, in those meetings is about a fact, if people were debating whether uh, the return to education is what you said it was or something about completion rates, and if you said, well, um, Cece said so, then you'd win. So uh, that, that take, that, that's a heck of a reputation. Uh, I want to thank uh, Elizabeth Donahue for helping me uh, get here today, and I appreciate uh, this, this audience. And, um, uh, Although I guess I'm like one of the only people here with a tie on. Uh, okay, well, uh, I was taught that when you come from, uh, if you're an expert, that means you came from 50 miles away, at least 50 miles away, and you wear a tie. So here I am. Um, I wanted to talk, as you see, about the jobs dilemma we face um, and what it would take to move from talk to action. Uh, right now, we're stuck uh, in a, a pretty deep hole. Uh, where there's a set of solutions uh, and a set of problems and uh, it seems like a deep, deep chasm uh, between them. Uh, I want to think about how we can bridge that chasm. It's not going to happen um, this week, uh, but uh, I think with the correct diagnosis and perhaps a, a good prescription, uh, we can get closer uh, to that. Uh, I want to speak for maybe 30 minutes or so and then make sure we have ample time for um, uh, questions and, and, uh, and perhaps even answers. So let's begin with where we are, how do we get here, and how do we get out. Actually, let's begin and end with all of that. Uh, we've been stuck in this cycle, I call it a shampoo economic cycle, bubble bust repeat. 
Uh, for uh, uh, quite a while now, um, the uh, uh, last few business cycles uh, ended with uh, the implosion of a dot-com bubble, then a housing bubble. Uh, if you go back another cycle, you can kind of see another real estate bubble back there. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, as uh, many have I think, written and commented, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I really want to get to the jobs problem. Um, this kind of a recession is, is pretty tough to climb out of. Um, you know, Rogoff's work talks about uh, the difficulty in uh, dealing with, uh, in, in, in moving from recession to recovery when uh, important sectors are deleveraging, household sector, corporate sector, and all of that because of the, the debt overhang. But I actually argue that there's a, a particularly pernicious dynamic when it's a housing bubble. Um, and Cece will remember, uh, I was one of the members of the housing team at the White House, and we had endless meetings trying to figure out the way out of that uh, morass, uh, and uh, a morass that still persists. One of the problems you have when there's a housing bubble is uh, financial institutions can engage in extend and pretend. Uh, that is, if you have a, a dot-com bubble, uh, to some extent, um, equity, uh, uh, the, the price or the value of a stock can really go from, you know, inflation bubble territory on Monday to cents on the dollar on, on Friday, just based on kind of an automatic mark-to-market -market that occurs in, in, uh, when an equity bubble bursts. But in a debt bubble, it can be tougher, especially uh, when it's housing, because banks can sit on these loans for uh, months and months and years and years, extending and pretending, hoping that non-performing loans will come back to life. And in fact, in many cases, if they were actually to admit the quality of the balance sheet, uh, that would mean that they were undercapitalized and they'd be in all kinds of trouble. So this type of recession is especially tough to climb out of. And I think when you're thinking about prescription, it's, uh, it's useful to keep that in mind. Uh, but that shouldn't box us in. We should, uh, we should be in box one, but we're stuck in box three or four. Um, this is a very simple two-by-two two matrix. Life is much more complicated than this, especially at an august institution like Princeton, but just kind of breaking things down into their most simple places. If you just think of uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy as, as being uh, pro-growth or contractionary, uh, what we really want to be in, of course, is box one, where both um, uh, 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 pedal to the, uh, uh, or pressure on the, on the accelerator is coming both from monetary and fiscal policy. Now, the Fed is kind of, is, is in my view, trying to do what they can. Uh, certainly, they could do more, no question about it. But I think, um, uh, given some internal constraints that, that they're facing, I think they're, they're at least trying to be in, in, on the growth side of the monetary policy uh, matrix there. Um, but of course, fiscal Fiscal policy is moving uh, quite quickly, in fact it's already moved, from uh, growth to contraction. At this point, the um, uh, diminished fiscal impulse, that is the fading of, of fiscal policy, is shaving growth off of, of GDP. I mean, probably about a half a percent now according to some estimates, but it could be as much as a percent next year. CC and I were just sitting there bemoaning the possibility that unemployment insurance uh, extended benefits might not get extended. You know, they run out at the end of next month. And that really uh, is a bad thing for millions of people on extended the benefits, but also for the macro economy. We're stuck in, in box three, which, you know, and, uh, and um, uh, you know, there are lots of, there, there, there is this kind of anti-Fed sentiment uh, out there as well, and to Bernanke's credit, I think he's, he's, he's trying to ignore that. But I think you have to ask yourself, why? Uh, why are we stuck uh, in, in, the, in the wrong box right now? And uh, I think there are uh, at least three or four reasons. Um, I encourage you to suggest other ones. Why is it that we're stuck with a, a solution set over here and a problem set over here? The solution set including uh, fiscal policy stimulus in the, in the body of the American Jobs Act, which while may not be perfect, uh, uh, certainly has a lot to recommend it. But if you don't like that fiscal stimulus, I'm happy to talk about other ideas. But the, the main point is to get into box one there. Well, I think there are at least four reasons, or I, thinking, I was thinking three, but I gave a talk the other day and someone added the fourth one, so I'll put that on there. I think, that, I think she was right. Um, the first reason why we're stuck in the wrong box is because there are people who, politicians, who want the president to fail. I mean, they have said as much. Uh, I'm an economist, not a political scientist. I'm not going to speak to that. I think it's despicable and uh, you know, just, a, just a terrible, a terrible way to, 
to do policy. Uh, but anyway, there, there, there are those who, who are, 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 uh, simply want the president to fail. One. Then there are those who actually don't really believe that, that fiscal policy works. Um, they saw the Recovery Act come onto the scene and unemployment went up. Ergo, it didn't work. Now, again, I'm separating out those who will just say it didn't work because it's in their political interest, so put those aside. You know, they're just willing to throw the economy under the bus for their own political gain. I have no truck with them. Um, but there are those who actually don't, and, and there are a lot of people out there who feel the same way. And the basic problem is, you know, Americans don't do counterfactuals. I mean, maybe the ones who studied econ here do, but most people don't do counterfactuals. So to say to them, uh, as many independent analysts, including the Congressional Budget Office, would say that, in fact, the Recovery Act shaved a couple of points off the uh, unemployment rate, it would be something like 11 percent now instead of 9, doesn't really move them. So, you know, number one, nefarious motives, number two, just don't do counterfactuals. Number three, irrational fear of budget deficits. And ladies and gentlemen, I can't overemphasize this problem. Um, there is a terribly irrational fear of budget deficits, a great misunderstanding of the impact of temporary stimulus on budget deficits. We've got, I think, a pretty good graph on this at the uh, Center on Budget and Policy Priorities uh, where, I, where, I, where I apply my trade. Um, and the, the punchline here, uh, well, here, let me just show you what we're talking about, if I point it, point here. Um, if you look at this bubble, these are, these are the factors that are contributing to the budget deficit between now and about 10 years out. And if you look at the little black line bumping along the bottom, that's the deficit without all of these uh, factors against the CBO baseline. Uh, and if you, uh, if you uh, look at um, uh, the Recovery Act, uh, an $800 billion recovery, it gets into the system, it contributes a bunch to the, to the budget deficit, but then it gets out. Temporary spending, even large amounts of temporary spending, simply don't have any recognizable effect on the medium or long-term budget deficit. By next year, the Recovery Act is going to be responsible for less than half a percent of the deficit to GDP re uh, ratio, and absolutely nothing will contribute absolutely nothing to the growth of the debt. It will increase the level a little bit, but nothing to the growth of the debt. If stimulus packages that get in and out are not the problem, the problem are the things that keep on giving, like the Bush tax cuts. And you know, in order to achieve a stable debt to GDP ratio, you need uh, to achieve primary balance. I, I can talk more about the arithmetic of this when we get to the end of the talk if you want. But the basic punchline is if the Bush tax cuts were to sunset, um, we would uh, uh, be most of the way there towards a, a, a sustainable budget path. The Recovery Act has nothing to do with it. And this um, lack, the, the fact that people fail to understand uh, and cite the budget deficit as a reason not to do temporary stimulus is a complete economic non sequitur and a very damaging and misleading view. Um, I think the fourth uh, reason that I might give is the filibuster. Um, I noticed the other day that um, the infrastructure ideas from the American Jobs Act went up for a vote in the Senate, and uh, uh, 51 uh, senators voted for it. So it won a majority, but of course it did not win a filibuster-proof majority. So the advent of filibusters is also a reason why we can't get our uh, problems and solutions matched. Now that's not all that convincing because, and I think Cece was pointing this out earlier, that's not all that convincing because if you, you get out of the Senate, you're stuck in the House. Uh, and, you know, I was sort of elated. I mean, I, I think anything, nothing gets out of the Senate these days. So the fact that, the fact that uh, uh, you know, if you had a majority in the Senate, you would have had the infrastructure bill out of the Senate anyway, that's just half the battle. Basically, we're stuck in dysfunctional politics. So that's, that's number four, five, and six. Um, still, what, so, so what do we do in the short term? I mean, this is supposed to be a talk about jobs. I'm not just going to be here bemoaning everything that's wrong for the next uh, 20 minutes, or Elizabeth would be very unhappy with me. Um, well, the president actually has the right idea. Uh, he's out there trying to figure out what we can do in terms of uh, job creation with ideas that uh, don't invoke Congress. But the fact is um, that uh, without the purse strings, it's really hard to move the needle on unemployment. I mean, there's some things you can do, and I'm for them. I particularly think some of the ideas in the housing market are, uh, are worth doing. Um, the difficulties that the housing market continues to face 
are still um, very much a, uh, an albatross around, the, uh, around this recovery that can't seem to get started. And there are three different uh, areas that uh, um, we can do stuff on without Congress, um, figuring out ways to get more homeowners to uh, seek refis, refinancing at lower rates that can pump some real money into the economy. Um, uh, Fannie and Freddie, the uh, 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 former GS, uh, government sponsored entities that are now wards of the state, they actually hold a lot of foreclosed properties. They own a lot of um, bankrupt uh, foreclosed uh, homes where people defaulted on their mortgages. We can actually, there are ways that we can actually move those REOs off of the housing market into the rental market. Um, at, at, at there's principal write downs. I don't want to go into details on this now. It's not the topic of my talk. If during Q&A you want to ask a little bit more about the housing ideas, I'm happy to talk about them. It's something I, I think a lot about. I even have a slightly radical idea that I'd be happy to share with you if you're interested. Um, but uh, there, there's, that, that's probably, in my view, where the most traction may come from these, uh, this kind of we can't wait campaign that the president is on, and I think he's got the right idea. But the fact is that as long as we're stuck where we are, uh, we are by de definition stuck where we are. <laughs> and uh, it's going to be pretty tough uh, to move forward in what is a, uh, a uniquely dysfunctional period. And in fact, again, I'm not going to be, uh, I don't want to try to be depressing, but I also don't want to put on rose-colored glasses. I've been in this business for a long time, and I know many people in the audience have as well. And you can correct me if you feel differently, but I have never seen a period like this where the ability of our nation, of our policymakers, of our federal government to self-correct is so fundamentally threatened. If we are unable to accurately diagnose and prescribe and act upon uh, the problems that we face, there is no system that can survive if it can't self-correct, whether it's a biological system or a political system. And the inability of our current system to self-correct is fundamentally threatening to, uh, uh, to, to our democracy. Ergo, uh, I want to spend the rest of my time talking about uh, the way forward. I talked about short-term stimulus, but in the long term, uh, I think it's about uh, uh, a, a recognition of, um, a recognition of uh, the failure of the current economic model and a pursuit of a new one. Let me start actually with that third bullet. You know, around a university, it's probably not a big reach to say that it's useful to operate within a model. It's useful to have, and, and I know um, Paul Krugman often emphasizes this in his work in ways that I think is, is, uh, is, is very resonant. Um, models of anything, whether it's the economy or uh, anything else, are simplifications uh, and often lack uh, nuance. But in fact, I would argue that it is a, uh, an extremely wrong, damaging, and fundamentally bereft uh, model that has been driving uh, the economic decisions we've been making for decades, and we're paying the price for it. Um, what is the current economic model? Uh, right now, I think there's a real uh, pragmatism trying to break out, uh, but uh, it's, not, it's not being, uh, it, it hasn't really gotten very far. The current economic model, I would argue, is the uh, four little points under uh, that uh, first bullet. The uh, rational expectations model, this was kind of the, uh, 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 the model that um, uh, kind of defeated Keynesianism back in the, seven, in the latter 70s when, when high unemployment and high inflation showed up on the same stage. Those villains weren't supposed to co-occupy the stage in, in a Keynesian model, and that coincided with um, a, uh, uh, that coincided with um, the uh, um, uh, birth of, uh, of, of, of rational expectations thinking in, uh, in, in universities across the country. And here, the idea was the less government, the better, because the only thing the government's going to do is screw up the market functions that will uh, always make the best uh, and most efficient choices. Markets will police themselves, they'll self-correct, and again, the less government, the better. That also coincided with the supply side trickle down model that was extremely beneficial to those who uh, 
uh, wanted to see their uh, taxes uh, cut and, and, and to those uh, uh, in the lobbying community who uh, uh, clearly benefit from um, regressive changes in taxation. Um, the idea was uh, very felicitous to them that you could have less government, government that self-corrects and uh, um, uh, uh, government that uh, needs a lot less revenue because you don't need to regulate. Um, the safety net has the opposite effect that you want. It disincentivizes people to work. So um, really this fits, the, the, the rational expectations married to supply side trickle down, um, uh, I would argue was the dominant model uh, of, of the economy uh, for the last a few decades. Now, you know, you might raise your hand and say, well, well, wait a second, George Bush uh, um, uh, passed a Keynesian stimulus. Well, we used to say that the definition of a Keynesian is a Republican in a recession. Uh, the the uh, uh, Keynesian downturn um, was, uh, was widely accepted. Um, in fact, I'd argue it's less widely accepted now than it was even back to Nixon. But, but uh, you know, when you hit the downturn, then you sort of had to get serious and actually get worried and maybe try some Keynesian stuff. Uh, but uh, arguably, you know, that was just kind of the exceptional period. Generally, you wanted to be subscribing to rational expectations um, with uh, fiscal policy that was supply side, cross your fingers and, you know, hope it all trickled down. Um, well, it turns out that if you, uh, if you, um, a little disorganized on my, where I was on my slides here, turns out that if you um, uh, cut people's, uh, if you cut people's, uh, if you if you cut the taxes of the highest wage people, you don't really stimulate a lot more economic growth, but you sure do enrich the folks at the top of the income scale. And this is a a, a well known graph by now, but it just came out from the Congressional Budget Office a few weeks ago, and it just shows the uh, growth in uh, after tax income over these few decades from the 70, 79 to two thousand and seven. And you can see the pattern there; it's very clearly one of greater inequality. Well, you know, there's this interesting argument now that. Uh, the the, the, the uh, uh, inequality deniers like to, to say two things. One, they like to say, um, oh, there's something wrong with all your measures, and then we come out and we have like 15 different ways of showing it, and uh, then they say, okay, 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 we get it. It's not that, that the, there, maybe inequality has increased, but in fact, um, there's enough mobility in the economy to offset the, uh, to offset the inequality. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's just uh, also a, a bogus argument. This is some new data. It's a little complicated. But I'm going to take you through it very quickly. Just, uh, I happened to run into Catherine Bradbury, who's a really interesting, smart economist who works at the uh, Boston Federal Reserve, and she studies mobility. See, here's the thing. When you think of income inequality, think of like a hotel with a uh, the bottom floor and, and, and the quality of the uh, uh, rooms in the hotel get better as you move up from the, from the basement, uh, you know, funky apartment in the basement all the way to the beautiful uh, penthouse. And as income inequality grows, the hotel stretches out, it gets taller. The distance between the floors grow. It actually takes longer. There's a greater economic distance to get from uh, one floor to the next. There's just a wider distribution of income and the greater distance between the floors of the hotel. What the conservatives try to say to offset um, nasty pictures like this one is that you know, it, 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 we, we've got more mobility now. And so people can, yes, the floors are further apart, but the elevator moves more quickly, and they can get from floor to floor faster. Well, actually, that's not even really exactly what they say. What they usually say is, uh, don't worry about inequality because mobility exists. But that's a non sequitur. Mobility has to accelerate if you're going to offset greater inequality. That elevator has to move more quickly. And in fact, um, what, sh uh, um, what uh, what Catherine shows is that, in fact, uh, uh, the rate of mobility, if anything, has diminished. There was kind of an argument for years of whether the rate of mobility was flat or falling. But uh, Catherine uh, has done some statistical tests here and finds that, um, you know, from the peaks in the various uh, 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 series here, you can, you can find um, uh, a statistically significant decline. And what the decline means is less mobility. And I can, uh, all, uh, in, in these lines, she has many, many different measures in her study. But this is, in, in the top line, for example, is the number, I'm sorry, the percent of families in the richest quintile who move down. And if that, if there's fewer of those and there's less mobility, uh, you can go to the bottom and ask uh, how, what percent of poor families move up. You know, certainly no more of them. That line looks pretty flat. 
Um, the percent of the richest quintile who move far, meaning more than one quintile over these 10-year spans, et cetera, et cetera. I, we can go into, into the data more deeply if you want during Q&A, but the point is that uh, we, have, we, we have a lot more inequality and, um, uh, if anything, less mobility, certainly not more. So our, um, uh, this uh, toxic combination of, of uh, a self-correcting market system, less government the better, married to supply side trickle down, has led to uh, uh, higher inequality and, uh, and less mobility. Uh, um, and, and so at this point, the best I can say for us is that we kind of have a, uh, at least among, among economists, we don't really have a new model yet. At best, we have sort of a pragmatic view that says, well, we should take a little bit from there and a little bit from that. And pragma pra pragmatism without a model doesn't have any backbone. It, it provides too little guidance to the larger questions regarding the big issues, inequality, productivity, jobs, climate, et cetera. So I'm going to offer a new model, and here's why. <laughs> um, it's not just that we have a jobs problem because we lost millions of jobs in the Great Recession. This graph simply, this, you can do this with you know, 30 seconds and a decent internet connection. This is not econometrics. But I think it's a profound set of bars. I'm not the first person to discover this by any stretch of the imagination. But wrap your head around this. This just measures employment growth peak to peak over business cycles going back to the 1950s. And you try to go peak to peak so you extract the impact of recession. And every single decade, uh, this is not necessarily a political observation. It's Republicans and Democrats. Every single decade from the 50s through the, through the 90s, we added between 20 and 30 percent in terms of employment. But in the 2000s, 4 percent. And of course, 07 to, to 10, down 6 percent. That's a little better because we've come up a little bit since then. But, but uh, what we have to figure out, if we're going to get anywhere, is what the heck happened here. And if this, is the new, if this is the new normal, we are deeply screwed. Um, let's stick with this. What happened in the 2000s? We can't get to the correct prescription if we don't have the right diagnosis. Well, one argument is actually kind of interesting. It has to do with um, uh, productivity. You know, the Luddites always argued that they were worried they used to go around bashing machines because they were always worried that more productivity would mean less jobs. Um, I used to work a lot with labor movements, and um, um, you know there were people in 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 in, in labor who who you know, really didn't want to hear about productivity growth. But you know the card-carrying economist in me always really kept in mind uh, that in fact, if you just plot and th this is productivity and job growth indexed to 100 in 1947, if you just plot productivity along with employment, they just kind of grow together forever. And the intervening variable there is demand. We always had more demand to absorb the increase in productivity growth, and that created more employment. And all was, you know, all was pretty okay, putting aside distributional issues, which I've already talked to you about, the fact that productivity gains were so narrowly shared. But, you know, clearly something, something changed. You have this, this uh, 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 period in the 2000s where employment growth was flat and productivity accelerated. What happened in the 2000s? Well, uh, there are a number of hypotheses, some of which may be familiar to you, some of which may be less so. Um, a recent paper by David Auder et al. Um, argues that um, uh, one thing that happened was there was a lot more import penetration uh, from low-wage countries, particularly China. Uh, this just looks at something called an import penetration ratio, which is just Chinese imports divided by gross domestic purchases, basically, by, by uh, domestic expenditures. So it's basically the share of domestic expenditures, uh, Chinese imports as a share of domestic expenditures. That line there in 2001 is there because that's when China joined the WTO. And um, uh, you can see a, a very sharp acceleration of, uh, of, of imports there. And they run a pretty interesting econometric uh, model and, and argue that, particularly for manufacturing, uh, this uh, uh, accelerated uh, import penetration for China explained uh, more than half of the about three plus million manufacturing jobs lost in the 2000s. So, one answer there is import penetration from low-wage countries. Now, actually, as a pretty free-trading kind of guy, um, I'm not saying this is necessarily 
an obvious problem, except for the fact that one of the main reasons this occurred had to do with the fact that the Chinese managed their currency. This is not a surprise. I don't expect police to come in from the doors and arrest me for saying this. Uh, the president says this. The treasury secretary says this. Uh, this is a known problem. Uh, and uh, so one of the things, I'm uh, again, I'm moving from prescription to diagnosis, one of the things we have to do is take seriously the issue of currency management. There's a study by Bill Klein, who's a, I think, a you know, pretty serious academic on these matters, uh, who argues that if the Chinese uh, allow their currency to appreciate um, uh, to where, where it, it ought to be set by market exchange rates, uh, by market forces in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in exchange rates, uh, our trade deficit would, our, our manufacturing goods trade deficit would almost go to zero. Now that may be a larger effect than would actually occur, but um, uh, that's how out of whack uh, that is. So, so how do you do that? Well, I told you nothing gets out of the Senate, right? I said that a few minutes ago. Well, just the other day, the Senate passed filibuster proof, you know, 60 votes. The Senate passed a China currency bill a bill that would actually give the administration the authority to impose countervailing duties on uh, goods that were subsidized uh, through a, a currency management mechanism. Uh, this is a good bill. It's not perfect, but this is a really good bill. And uh, uh, the House, it's, it's now it's languishing in the House. It's just the point that CeCe made earlier, which is, um, yeah, you know, you think you're out of the Senate, you're home free these days, you're not. But that's a solution. So, one, one, so that, that's one explanation for the lousy 2000s. I'm not saying I've got all of them, but I've got a list here, and I think, I think you know, I tried to think pretty carefully about that. Um, there is a very interesting argument that says labor-saving technology has accelerated. Labor-saving technology has accelerated. That it's not just that we have this ongoing uh, race between technology and, uh, and employment, but that, uh, there's a new book by McAfee, and I'm not sure how you pronounce the guy's name from MIT. He's got like a mostly consonants in his last name. Uh, Eric, Eric, you know who I'm talking about? Breg Nolson or something, anyway. I, I apologize, he's a really great, great guy. And he and, he and um, Andrew McAfee, whose name I can easily pronounce, um, wrote a book called Race Against the Machine, which I commend to you. And it's a very interesting look at this question of um, whether labor-saving technology accelerated uh, as part of uh, the explanation. Um, but here's a biggie. Here's a biggie. And some, uh, that last one, other than, that last one I'm not, I'm not you know, I, I think um, import penetration is something we could do something about on the exchange rate side. Labor saving technology acceleration, I should train more kids in engineering and mechanic, uh, mechanical engineering and, and, and the like. But that's, that's going to happen. Here's a biggie. That I, this is my theory, okay, my hypothesis. So I don't have a slide to show you that this is true, but I think I'm right. I call it allocative inefficiency. And there may be somebody else called it that, and I stole it from them. But the words that come to my mind are allocative inefficiency. That is, we allocated too many of society's resources to wasteful things that move money around, that take advantage of microsecond arbitrage trading, and that uh, don't uh, invest thoughtfully with foresight in areas of the economy that could actually expand and create opportunity. We allocate inefficiently. And I think that that accelerated in, in, in the 2000s relative to earlier periods. Obviously, I'm thinking about um, uh, financial innovations, um, but that, 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 that's, that's not all. Here's another thing that happened in the 2000s. Startups were actually quite weak. Um, I recently wrote a piece, it was, uh, ran in the, um, as an op-ed in the New York Times, I recently wrote a piece pointing out that um, uh, small businesses love to say that they're the engine of job growth. And I'm all for small businesses. I think American entrepreneurs and small businesses are great. But the NFIB kind of drives me crazy and <laughs> uh, because they have a very conservative uh, agenda that has very little to do with actually helping small businesses. Um, and one of the things that I looked at was, well, is it really true that small businesses are the engine of job growth such that we should um, inefficiently allocate? Uh, on their behalf, as I would argue that we do. And in fact, it, it's not the case. And the, the research of a, of, a, of a guy at the University of Maryland named John Haltewanger is really quite pathbreaking, and I encourage you to take a look at it in this front. It's some of the best data on the issue of job creation by firms, um, uh, by firm age and firm size. And it turns out that age really matters. And that what matters in terms of jobs is really startups that survive. 
Now, about 40% of startups die within, uh, uh, within about five years, but the ones that survive and get big, <laughs> it's almost by definition, um, actually matter a ton for job growth. And in the 2000s, we had as many startups as we usually do, but they just weren't adding jobs the way they, they did. And again, I think that part of it uh, is that um, they, they simply didn't get the, the, the venture capital, the attention, uh, the cultivation that they needed um, uh, relative to earlier decades because there was so much um, froth going on at, with uh, the housing bubble and the financial innovation uh, therein. Um, look, this made, there was a, one of the reasons why this recovery stunk so bad in the 2000s was because it was actually pretty short and um, never felt like much of a recovery to uh, most families. Uh, look at the bottom part of this slide, just the bottom part. Um, that's the real income of working age households. Um, that is households headed by someone 65 or less. This is census data. Median income. So this is working age households, middle class working age households. There, in the, in the 1990s, their income grew about 10%. I mean, you see it goes from a low there of about 50, these are $2010. It goes from about 54,000 to around 60,000. Uh, so they had a, a, a nice bump there uh, in, in, in income growth, um, much like you'd expect. I mean, you have this recession of 1991, not a very deep recession, but you have a recession and, and middle class families lose ground like they always do in a recession. And in fact, it was a jobless recovery initially. Uh, you didn't have a lot of jobs, not that different from this one if you actually look at the private sector. You had a jobless, uh, uh, but, but once things took hold and unemployment started to really fall, um, these families got a very nice bump. I mean, their income was actually growing at the rate of productivity there for a New York minute, at least in the, in the, in the latter 1990s. And then you hit a recession uh, in 2001, again, a pretty mild recession, 2001, and they just never get back. And it was the first business cycle on record. We have longer term data for um, all households, so I printed that above. It was the first business cycle on record where middle class families actually, uh, uh, you know, either, either just were stable or lost ground. So for these families, the recession was a, was, was a problem on top of a problem. And if you're going to have a deregulatory, trickle down, rational expectation, supply side model, um, you're going to uh, court these kinds of bubbles uh, that we've seen. Uh, so you have the, you know, the, the shampoo economy, bubble bust repeat, uh, and uh, uh, you, you, uh, that, that's, that's no way, uh, I think that in and of itself, a pernicious bubble and an insufficient regulatory function in and of itself is an explanation for why the 2000s were, were so bad. So here, in, in, in closing, let me uh, introduce um, what I would argue is, oh, sorry. Um, let me introduce what I think of as uh, of, uh, of the uh, of the model that I want I want to leave you with. Um, this is this is the way I believe uh, uh, we need to we need to move forward. In the short term, I've told you we need fiscal stimulus. I don't think we're going to get it. Uh, not much. Um, I can talk about what I think we will get. Interesting. Let me just say one thing, just because I think it's interesting. Um, the payroll tax holiday will probably get renewed, um, so you know that's good. But you know that's not new fiscal impulse. That's just keeping your foot where it is on the accelerator. It's not putting it down any further. So that's going to be of some use. Now, myself and some of my colleagues worked on an idea that we called FAST. It's an infrastructure plan. Fix America's schools today. This is just a really simple idea of um, of taking uh, uh, um, the the problem that uh, especially in a tight budget environment out there at the states and localities, remember, they have to balance their budgets. So it's, very tight. it's a very tight world out there for, for schools, uh, for public schools. And they've just let their repair and their modernization backlog grow and grow and grow. The repair backlog is really in bad shape if you, if you look at, uh, at the public schools. Even in my town, I live in Alexandria, Virginia. We're a very wealthy town. I could take you into schools there and you'd walk in and you'd say, I, I wouldn't want my kid to go to this school. 
And that's in, in some of the, well, you can imagine what some of the schools look like in very rough districts. So there's a lot of repair work to do. And there's a lot of unemployed people who do precisely that kind of work. Insulation, windows, roofing, you know, even greening up some of these places, solar panels. So there's a lot you could do. And so we had this infrastructure idea, fix America's schools today, fast. To, um, uh, to marry that problem with the solution, and the president put it in his jobs plan, and I thought that was great. $30 billion for, uh, for school repair and modernization. Well, the Republicans said, no thanks, we don't want to do that. <laughs> but I'm here to report, and you may not know this, uh, Senator Warner and Senator Webb uh, have a bill, um, which kind of, which, 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 you know, kind of, sort of, in a way I'll explain, aims to do the same thing. And who has signed on as, a, as someone who likes that idea, or maybe he's his co-sponsor? Eric Cantor, big Republican, right? Okay, so here's the problem. You knew there was a catch. Uh, the problem is that the way they go about it is really, um, uh, I, I would argue, you know, somewhat unfortunate and not particularly uh, effective compared to what we originally outlined. They, they want to do this uh, through the tax credit for the national, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, where, where, where you have these, a uh, historic preservation fund? the National Historic Preservation Registry. So they want to give you a tax credit if you repair and modernize a public school that's on the National Historic Registry. Well, there's not that many public schools on the National Historic Registry. I think there might be a couple of hundred. And it's really a screwy way to go about it because what you have to do is you actually, if you're the developer, you actually have to buy the school back and lease it to the town and you get a tax credit. Anyway, it's not, a, it's not a, a, as good a way to do it, but you know, these days, maybe, maybe there's something there. In the short run, we need fiscal stimulus. In the long run, in the longer run, we, we, we simply need a, a, a new model. Um, and pragmatism, and I'm a big form of, I'm, I'm, I'm a big supporter of pragmatic solutions, but pragmatism won't do it. I think what, need, what, what, what needs to, I think what needs to happen is we need, we need a hybrid based on the notion that markets fail. And, 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 and they don't always fail. And, you know, Hayek was right when he talked about price signals and the coordination therein and uh, market mechanisms making the best choices. I'm, I'm completely signing off to all of the above. But markets fail, and they fail a lot more than most people like to recognize. And the complexity and the interconnectedness actually amplifies not only failure, but what economists call tail risk. That is the idea that a failure, because of, com of, of the interconnectedness, that a market failure that might have been contained in, in, in earlier days now is a contagion across the globe. And you can see this happening all over the place. Markets go off the rails. We've seen this bubble bust repeat cycle repeatedly. And by the way, this is not a new insight. Adam Smith wrote compellingly about speculative bubbles. The rational expectationists forgot about all that. Hyman Minsky, who's day has come back, uh, argued that um, stability itself is, is, it creates instability, that, 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 that speculation is, uh, 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 that speculation absent adequate deregulation will always derail uh, markets. So that's point A, that our hybrid model has to reflect market failure and pervasive market failure, and it's worse now because with complexity and interconnectedness, the tail risk of the damage done by a market failure is much worse than it used to be. B, you cannot find a transformational economic development in the history of our or any other advanced economy that doesn't have big, fat government fingerprints all over it. There's no question about it. I, I can take you back to the Revolutionary War and talk to you about machine tools. We didn't even have a government yet. But there were machine tools that were being uh, designed back there to uh, uh, build weaponry. By the way, much of what I'm about to describe does come out of building weaponry and defense, including, including the internet, uh, does come out of the uh, defense establishments. But at any rate, the point is that you can't find a transformational development that didn't have. Yeah, so so this, this notion, this nonsense that government doesn't create jobs is, 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 is an uh, incredibly destructive talking point. But that also, so, so there has to be a government role. And by the way, I think the president gets this. I think President Obama, if you go back and read his, uh, the, the most, uh, his 2011 State of the Union address, you'll actually see a very deep government investment agenda therein. And it's a very smart one, and it tends to focus on clean energy. And uh, I think he's right about that. Um, 
But it also implies something else we don't have. We don't have an efficient, amply funded government sector. And in fact, I've talked about market failure. What about government failure? What about government failure? Here, one side of the argument has a very strong political advantage. Those who argue against what I'm saying have a strong political advantage because they can tell you that government won't work, that government will fail, and then when you elect them, they will prove it. <laughs> and they've done so uh, time and again. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It is very easy to prove to people that government doesn't work, especially if you're running government. You just screw it up. And they're doing it night and day now. I mean, just look at the debt ceiling debacle. Now, I am an optimist. I'm kind of with Churchill on this notion that the Americans will ultimately choose the right option after going through all the rest. But what can, you can't be passive about this. What can we do to get back on track to ensure this Churchillian prediction? Because I started from a place of if we don't do something different, we may not get back on the right track. And I think Churchill was right, and I think we will, but I'm worried. So there's two parts to this. There's two parts to getting back on track, to, 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 to try to get to this model that I'm describing, where we acknowledge market failure, we regulate for market failure. You know, just because, somebody had a great description of this the other day. They said, you know, this Roghoff, Reinhardt stuff about how um, a debt uh, leveraging, uh, you know, a, 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 a a, re a recovery that's beset by over leveraging and um, by deleveraging and, and, and indebtedness is going to take forever. It doesn't have to. And Dean Baker's been good on this point. It doesn't have to. We do have the policy measures. It, it's sort of like saying if you're driving through, a, this is with an analogy, I think it was uh, Matt Iglesias who said this, you know, if you're driving through a really foggy, dangerous place, it doesn't mean you have to have a car accident. You can turn your lights on and you can drive more carefully. We actually have policy solutions that are uh, available to us, but we're not availing ourselves of them. So for that to, for that to change, and it isn't going to change this week, but it, it, it does mean that the next year is incredibly important, as is the next election. The next year is incredibly important. It, 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 I mean, maybe every election feels like the most important one. This one feels really important to me. And two things have to change. One, we have to get back to a place where facts matter. I'm sorry, but I live in the world of facts. You're at a university. I suspect you do as well. I was going to say something nasty about people from the English department, but I'm not. Um, uh, you're, you're, you're here. Facts matter to you. They matter to me. They don't matter to a lot of people out there. I was doing a debate. Cece said I, I have uh, part of my job is going on television debating people for better or worse. Um, and I was debating Herman Cain's, um, the guy who, who set up Herman Cain's 999 plan, this uh, accountant from Cleveland who um, created this plan. Uh, and I said to him on national, te well, no, on cable television, I said to him, you know, your plan is going to raise taxes on the middle class, because it was obvious to me that that would be the case. And this was before the Tax Policy Center had their numbers. And, you know, I explained to him why that had to be the case arithmetically. And he's like, no, it won't. And, of course, the moderator's like, well, okay, two opposing views. <laughs> <laughs> so facts have to matter again, my friends. And, uh, you know, I have a piece out in today's Atlantic. If you want to look at Atlantic.com, I wrote a piece today on how I think we can maybe start to head back down that path. I can say more about that. But more profoundly, I actually think that at the end of the day, we have to, go, uh, we have to move from a yo-yo uh, uh, yo -yo economy to a wit economy. Uh, what do these silly little acronyms mean? Well, yo-yo uh, means you're on your own. WIT means we're in this together. So here I've talked to you about productivity, about import penetration, about inequality, about mobility, and I'm ending on this very mushy note of um, you're either on your own or we're in this together. Well, I actually don't think it's mushy. I actually think that there is uh, no way for our economy, our society, our communities, our families uh, to survive in a complex uh, world with seven billion people in it if we try to subscribe to this yo-yo, you're on your own uh, economy. Um, if we, you know, I, I hear it when Herman Cain, I know Herman Cain is, you know, the flavor of the moment, I get that, but I hear it when he says, um, on the, in the debates, you know, if you're unemployed, that's your fault. And if you, show up at the, uh, uh, if you show up at the emergency room and you're sick and you should, you know, then maybe you should die and everybody claps. 
I know that's just uh, maybe Tea Party craziness or whatever, but there's a germ of something in there that's infecting uh, America. And until we recognize that at the end of the day, we really are all in this together, uh, we're going to uh, be stuck where we are. If we can, as a nation, accept that reality, then we're going to be okay. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.